Hi, my name is Andrew Evans, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about the relationship between agency, responsibility, and blame, and how that relates to mental health. In particular, what we'll be interested in this video is sort of, does having a mental health condition make someone less responsible for their actions? Or maybe a better question is, in what ways might having a mental health condition makes someone less responsible? How does that relate to blame? How does this relate to morality and moral responsibility? These are sort of the questions of this video. So we can use this person as an example uh, here at the beginning. Suppose we have um, this individual who um, is very depressed and suppose they weren't able to make it to their best friend's birthday party because they were very depressed. We can ask, um, to what extent is this person responsible for their actions, for not attending the birthday party? Is the best friend justified in blaming this person for not attending the birthday party because of the depression? So there's lots of other examples and conditions that will come up in this video, but um, to keep it simple, if you want to keep coming back, you can think about this person as an example of when responsibility and blame might interact with having a mental health condition. Okay, so in this video, I focus on two papers. Um, you saw the authors there at the very beginning, um, Hannah Pickard is uh, the first author. She wrote a paper in 2011 called Responsibility Without Blame, Empathy in the Effective Treatment of Personality Disorder. So Pickard's view, um, Responsibility Without Blame, has been pretty influential. And you'll see that it's mentioned in this more recent paper by Dominic Murphy and Natalia Washington, which came out in 2022. And their paper is called Agency in Mental Illness and Cognitive Disability. Now, in these two papers, they talk about this relationship. A major question that runs through these papers is, in what ways do mental health conditions impact moral responsibility? Um, and the Murphy and Washington paper does discuss the Pickard paper. I don't actually focus on that discussion, how the two papers relate to each other. I'm kind of just going to give an overview of the different arguments of both of the papers to consider how... Um, we might think about responsibility and blame relating to mental health. Okay, so starting with the Pickard paper, I do want to note that, um, you know, just to give a content warning here at the beginning, there is some discussion of self-harm and suicide throughout the paper. This is in particular in relation to borderline personality disorder or personality disorders in general, in which sometimes self-harm behaviors are um, apart. Um, so there is some discussion of that throughout the paper. I'm not really going to focus on that here in this video, but I do want to note um, when reading the paper to keep that in mind. Okay, so one goal that Pickard has in this paper is distinguishing between responsibility, blameworthiness, and blame. And she argues that when clinicians treat people who have mental health conditions, and in particular she focuses here on personality disorders, Clinicians ought to hold people responsible for their actions without inflicting blame. That's her main argument. Okay, so let's take a step back. What are personality disorders? So I can't give a full description of what personality disorders are here in this video. Instead, I'm just going to provide some quotes from the DSM-5 um, that talk about personality dis disorders. So the DSM-5 says, quote, a personality disorder is an enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture, is pervasive and inflexible, and has an onset in adolescence or early adulthood, is stable over time, and leads to distress or impairment. Now, that is personality disorders in general. Personality disorders then are divided into three clusters in the DSM-5, cluster A, B, and C. And the reason I'm focusing here on cluster B is because this cluster of personality disorders is most often associated with um, being held morally responsible for behavior. Um, the reason being parts of the symptoms of these um, inner, of these personality disorders, are, they're very interpersonal, and they sometimes involve people um, hurting the people around them. Now, 
I want to be very careful about this. I don't think that Pickard in her paper is as careful as she could have been. Um, one, cluster B personality disorders, um, they really get a bad rap and they, um, they're they often discussed in pretty negative ways. Um, maybe with borderline personality disorder as a standout, they can be discussed in really negative ways. And sometimes mental health professionals can actually avoid treating these patients, which I think is just unjust, right? I don't think that should be allowed in mental health care um, to, to discriminate sort of against certain patients because of particular symptoms. Now, um, so I just want to be careful through, sort of in this video and in discussing personality disorders and moral responsibility to not use disparaging language towards people with these conditions, because ultimately these conditions are very painful, right? They cause a lot of suffering in the individuals with the conditions. So we should be mindful that even though certain times, um, in certain instances, people with these conditions may hurt other people, um, oftentimes they're really hurting a lot themselves. Um, so anyways, I just want to be very clear about that here at the beginning. I also want to note that these personality disorders have come under a lot of criticism as categories. So you can see there here in the first quote, they are defined as uh, deviations from expectations of society, right? Expectations of the individual's culture. And as we've talked about in previous videos, um, a critique of psychiatry is that it pathologizes um, sort of unwanted behavior or behavior that deviates from social norms. It's pretty explicitly the case here with personality disorders. So that has led some people to argue that these shouldn't be considered uh, mental disorders at all. We're not going to get into that discussion here in this video, but I also want to note that um, there has been like a historical critique of personality disorders. In particular, borderline and histrionic personality disorders have been critiqued as particularly targeted at women. Um, histrionic, the word comes from hysteria, right, which is um, associated with the uterus and this sort of older notion of women having um, quote unquote hysterical reactions, right? So anyways, I just want to note that personality disorders are controversial and we should be very careful and cognizant in the way we discuss people with these conditions. Okay, so here are the four cluster B personality disorders, and I'm just gonna read this last quote here. The DSM-5 says, quote, antisocial, antisocial personality disorder is a pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. Borderline personality disorder is a pattern of instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image, and affects in marked impulsivity. Histrionic personality disorder is a pattern of excessive emotionality and attention-seeking. And narcissistic personality disorder is a pattern of grandiosity, need for admiration, and lack of empathy. So you can see even in these short descriptions the way that social norms and judgments are built in right to these definitions of uh, disorders. Okay, so back to Pickard. Um, she starts by identifying these two ends of the spectrum, rescue and blame. And here she's talking about how clinicians can respond to people with personality disorders. She says that a clinician that, quote, rescues the patient treats them as totally non-responsible for their actions. But she finds this problematic because it doesn't recognize that the person has autonomy and oftentimes they are somewhat responsible for their actions. In contrast, we can have a clinician that, quote, blames the patient. The, the clinician that blames the patient treats them as totally in control of their actions. And blame also has a negative emotional reaction involved to it. Um, blaming someone is to have this, like, negative response to them. And this, you know, in a clinical setting can lead to patients really receiving less care or receiving neglect right, from a clinician. She thinks these are two opposite ends of the spectrum that clinicians should avoid. In contrast, she advocates for a clinical approach that treats patients as responsible, but does not blame them for their actions. So at first, this may seem counterintuitive. Isn't it the same thing to hold someone responsible for their actions and to blame them? We tend to use these terms as meaning the same thing. I'm holding someone responsible and I'm blaming them. But Pickard thinks that we can distinguish between responsibility and blame. 
And to defend this account, she has to define some terms. So now I'm just going to go through the way she thinks about agency, responsibility, blameworthiness, and blame. Okay, so this is a quote from Pickard on agency. She says, quote, first, the capacity to choose from a range of possible actions, at least in the minimal sense that on any particular occasion, one can choose either to act or to refrain from so acting. Second, the capacity to execute this choice, to do as one chooses, given normal circumstances. So here there are two sort of factors that she thinks are involved with agency. She goes on, quote, this common sense conception of agency naturally grounds judgments of responsibility. One is responsible for actions as opposed to automatic reflexes because it is up to one whether and how one acts. So long as one knows what one is doing, one is responsible for one's behavior to the degree that one can exercise control, choice and control over it. So for Pickard, um, agency involves these two capacities, right? The capacity to choose between different actions and the capacity to execute this choice, to do as one chooses. And she notes that this is always linked to responsibility, right? to have agency, to be acting in a situation, you're also responsible for your actions. Okay, so we can use this simple example. When I wake up in the morning, if I decide I'm going to have a warm beverage, I'm either going to have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, um, we normally would think I have agency in this situation, right? I can either act to have coffee or to have tea, and I am able to actually make that choice and execute on that action, and therefore responsible for whatever consequences arise out of that choice that I've made. Okay, responsibility. Pickard says, quote, Effective clinical treatment presupposes that service users are responsible for their behaviors insofar as they have conscious knowledge of what they're doing and can exercise choice and at least a degree of control over the behavior. As we saw, this is a traditional and common sense idea about what it means to be responsible, applicable not only to service users, but to us all. This idea of responsibility is essentially linked not to morality and their reactive attitudes, but to agency. Crucially, on this view, we are responsible for our actions, whether or not they are right, wrong, or neutral. From a moral point of view, we are responsible for our actions because we are their agents, insofar as we know what we are doing and can exercise co choice and control our behavior. What we do is up to us. So she's really linking agency and responsibility here. As long as we know what we're doing, we have a choice in the matter, we can execute on that choice, um, we're... Um, we have agency and we're also responsible for our actions. Whatever happens are our responsibility, but that's not just in a moral sense, right? Some, you know, what we do could be good. It could be bad or it could be neutral. A lot of the things we do are neutral, but if we have agency, we're responsible for what we do, right? So again, you know, we can, you know, so suppose I drink coffee and I'm more energetic than if I drink tea, um, I'm responsible for that, right? I chose to drink coffee and therefore I'm more energetic. And that might be neutral, that might be good or bad, but it might have nothing to do with morality at all, but it is a consequence of what I chose and therefore I am responsible for it. Okay, blameworthiness. Pickard says, quote, we judge a person to be blameworthy when they are responsible for harm and have no excuse. So this is the really, it's really short, but this is what she thinks blameworthiness is. It's a certain kind of responsibility. We're responsible for harm, right? So there's some moral um, information built in here. Um, if we're responsible for some harm and we have no excuse, then we're blameworthy. She goes on, quote, we are let we are yet left with the problem of how it is possible for clinicians to hold personality disorder service users responsible for harm for which they are recognized to be blameworthy and yet not to blame. So this is the really interesting point she makes. Blameworthiness is a little bit different from responsibility because it's responsibility for harm. If we're responsible for harming someone and we have no excuse, then we're blameworthy. 
But here in the second part, she's saying we can still say someone is responsible and they're blameworthy, but we don't blame them, right? She wants to distinguish between someone being blameworthy and us actually blaming them. Okay, so before we get to that, we can go back to this example. So this person doesn't go to their friend's birthday party. Um, maybe that person caused harm to that person. Um, but we can wonder, um, does their depression constitute an excuse, right? Is this person blameworthy, right? Are they held responsible for the harm or not? Um, we can kind of think about it along those lines. So what makes blame different? Actually blaming someone rather than just thinking that they're blameworthy. Pickard says, quote, blame carries a characteristic stain. Being the objects of another, being the object of another's blame hurts. She goes on, quote, part of what is distinctive about blame is that when in its grip, one feels entitled to one's blaming response because of what uh, the other has done. It feels as if they deserve it, even if one does not judge or believe that they do. This feeling of entitlement, of being in the right in relation to another's wrong, is the key to unifying act is the key to unifying active, um, I'm sorry, effective blame. When, what makes a negative emotion, um, emotional reaction, sorry, that should say a negative emotional reaction to another count as blame is the second order response the blamer has to the first order emotion, the feeling of entitlement. This feeling of entitlement places the responsibility for the blaming response on the blamed. It thereby gives the blamer a feeling of freedom to express blame, vent, and act out of whatever negative emotion they are experiencing. Although blame is not an action, and so not a form of punishment, it is a punishing mental state. So Pickard says a lot here, but what is she getting at? She's saying that we can judge someone to be blameworthy without actually blaming them, because blaming them is a sort of um, negative emotional response that we have. Um, we actually feel blame um, and it's punishing, right? It's not a punishment, but it's a punishing mental state. It stings, it hurts to be blamed for something. And she thinks there's two parts here. There's the emotional response that we have and then the feeling that the other person deserves this emotional response. I feel entitled to this emotional response, right? Um, I'm blaming you, you're to blame for me feeling this way. So I'm then entitled to vent, to express blame, to act out um, this negative emotion that I'm experiencing. So she thinks it's this sort of two part thing. We both feel this negative response, but it's also this feeling that I'm entitled to this negative response. That's what blame is. And that's distinct from blameworthiness, right? We can judge someone's blameworthy, but not actually feel this blame. Okay, so this might be what it looks like. So the friend can be really angry at the person and blame her for her um, absence from the party. Now, it's possible that instead he doesn't blame her, but he might think she's blameworthy. He might be able to judge that, yeah, she's responsible for the harm that, that caused me, but I don't feel this emotional response and this anger um, and I don't feel entitled to this response. Instead, I can just tell, yes, she's blameworthy, she's responsible, but I'm not blaming her, right? So that's the distinction that Pickard wants to make between blameworthiness and blame. And if that's confusing, I think it's a little bit confusing. She applies this to um, an example of spiders. Um, so this is a really <laughs> creepy uh, picture I found of a cartoon spider. So we might think that spiders are scary but we might not feel scared around spiders so we might think objectively spiders are a scary thing but i'm seeing the spider right now and i'm not feeling the emotion of fear this is kind of what's happening she thinks with blameworthiness and blame we might be able to judge that someone's blameworthy but we're not feeling the blame itself we're not experiencing that emotional response so in some Pickard is suggesting that clinicians can hold patients responsible and even believe they're blameworthy without actually blaming them, without feeling blame. And this only makes sense if we see blame as a negative emotional response that one feels entitled to have. So how does this help, right? How does this help uh, clinicians to better care for patients? 
She suggests that for clinicians to prevent themselves from blaming patients, they need to cultivate empathy and compassion for the patient. Sometimes this includes understanding the patient's past history better. So oftentimes with personality disorders, there is, um, not always, but oftentimes there is a history of trauma that leads to, or that has some causal relation to having a personality disorder. Um, Pickard says that sometimes understanding someone's past history um, can help a clinician feel empathy and feel compassion and therefore avoid this kind of blaming emotional reaction. So this is kind of her takeaway. All right, we can ask, what do you think of the way Pickard distinguishes between responsibility and blame? Initially, this isn't a very intuitive distinction, but she has made an argument here for how we can make this distinction. What do you think? Do you think that's successful? Also, do you think her suggestions to clinicians are helpful? Do you think the idea of trying to cultivate compassion and empathy and understand someone's history better can help clinicians to not blame patients for their actions, even if they're holding them responsible? All right, so I'm just gonna briefly end with a short discussion of this other paper by Murphy in Washington, which is called Agency in Mental Illness and Cognitive Disability. So while the Pickard paper was published in 2011, it's a little older, this paper um, is published recently in 2022. So here, Murphy and Washington discuss the ways in which having a mental health condition might impact agency and moral responsibility. And just like Pickard, they, they define these terms, right? What do they mean by agency? What do they mean by moral responsibility? They let us know. So for agency, quote, agency is the capacity we ascribe to agents who act in a way caused by their own mental states. So an agent is someone who is acting based on their own mental states, right? They are, um, um, they have agency if their actions come from their own mental states. And this is similar to, we can go back really quick to Pickard's way of defining agency. She thought of it as the capacity to choose from possible actions and to execute on that choice. This is similar enough to what uh, Murphy and Washington are saying um, that to have agency is the capacity to um, act in a way that's caused by your own mental states. All right, they go on to say, quote, philosophers tend to be interested in a richer notion of agency, which makes agents suitable objects of moral appraisal. Such agency involves the ability to discern and respond to reasons, although specifying what that involves is no easy task. Human adults are paradigmatic agents on this example. Human infants, substantially lacking the capacity for intentional action, are not agents but become agents over the course of their psychological development. So here, Murphy and Washington are saying that even though basically agency is just, you know, being able to act um, in a way that's caused by your own mental states, we generally connect it to moral responsibility. And that involves the ability to think about different reasons to act um, and, um, you know, having sort of certain cognitive capacities. We think adults generally have these cognitive capacities and infants generally do not. Okay. So this is kind of linked up to how they think about moral responsibility. They say, quote, not everything you do is something that you are morally responsible for. Indeed, there are some entities, non-human animals, for example, who are capable of acting, but, not, but do not count as morally responsible at all. So here they're saying, um, you know, agency isn't the same thing as moral responsibility. Um, some some an, animals, for example, can act, right? They can act as agents, but we don't hold them moral responsi morally responsible because moral responsibility seems to require certain cognitive capacities that animals don't have. So these authors explain that to be considered morally responsible, you have to have certain cognitive abilities, and they mention some here. 
the ability to appreciate normative considerations, to ascertain information relevant to particular normative judgments, to engage in effective deliberation, to recognize affordances, and to initiate actions which result in behavior in one's environment. So I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, but the point is, um, you know, in order to be a uh, to be held morally responsible, it's not enough to just be an agent for Murphy and Washington. You have to be able to um, consider different things, deliberate, um, get the right amount, get information from your environment about making an ethical judgment, um, and also the ability to actually make a choice and execute it, right? So they're talking about different capacities that an adult has that an infant and maybe um, a non-human animal tends not to have. So that's why we can hold an adult morally responsible and not an infant or non-human animal. Okay, so their main question is, in what ways can having a mental health condition decrease a person's agency and moral responsibility? And they consider some examples of mental health conditions. They consider addiction, delusion, obsessive compulsive disorder, and personality disorders. When they discuss personality disorders, they refer back to Pickard. Um, and they also consider the ways in which intellectual and cognitive disability might impact agency. Now, one thing I want to mention is that I think that their discussion um, does veer towards some problematic language at times um, when discussing people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities, some comparisons are made that I don't think are very, um, you know, humanizing for those groups. And similarly, when talking about personality disorders, some language is a bit disparaging. Um, but we can still, you know, look to the ideas and the arguments that these um, authors make in order to um, come to some conclusions about agency and moral responsibility in mental health care. Okay, so I'm going to zero in on just one condition that they talk about. Um, so this is from the obsessive compulsive and related disorders section of the DSM. And the DSM says OCD is, this is a quote, OCD is characterized by the presence of obsessions and or compulsions. Obsessions are recurrent, persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced as intrusive and unwanted, whereas compulsions are repetitive behaviors or mental acts that an individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. Now, um, the reason I'm focusing in on OCD is because I myself have OCD and something I've struggled with since I was a kid. Um, so I relate to this example, and the way that Murphy and uh, Washington discuss this example is they talk about, um, you know, how that OCD can sometimes be described as like a failure of the will, right? Even if a person wants to make a decision to stop obsessing or to stop the compulsive behavior, sometimes they really feel like they don't have that ability to. Um, and so this might be a way of decreasing their agency. Maybe they don't have agency. And certainly, maybe they even have agency, but they may not have moral responsibility for their actions. So this is just one example. You know, I can speak from experience that having obsessions and um, having compulsions, it's really hard to resist. Um, and, uh, you know, I can see how this would be an example in which in certain situations, agency or moral responsibility might be decreased in someone um, that has OCD. Okay, so what do they conclude? Murphy and Washington conclude that, um, you know, it really depends. Um, if the question is, do, do mental health conditions um, and does cognitive disability impact agency and moral responsibility? I think their answer is sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It really depends. So this is a quote from them. They say, quote, in this chapter, we urged a more nuanced view of moral responsible agency in mental illness. We argued that those with psychopathological diagnosis are not thereby exempt from the community of moral agents, rather the extent to which an individual is in an excusing or exempting condition is variable, independent on the particular psychological, social, and environmental factors that underlie the exercise of agency or undermine it. So here, Murphy and Washington are simply saying that it really depends. 
Um, there's a lot of factors that go into whether or not um, mental illness can impact our agency. So we have to really look at the specifics of um, a situation. They caution against saying that having a mental health condition all by itself um, excuses a person or um, reduces agency completely. There might be instances of this, but really we should really look at the um, specific instances and the specific context of a situation in order to determine if agency or moral responsibility can be attributed to a person or not. All right, well, um, I enjoyed talking about this subject because I think that um, we often connect responsibility and agency um, and blame to mental health conditions. And I think that the, all these authors do a really good job of uh, picking apart the different parts of that and asking some really interesting questions. Um, and that is all I have for this video. Uh, thank you for watching.